So let me just introduce uh, who we have here on the stage. This is Bill Barnett, former mayor of Spartanburg. We have Carol Lawton from Purpose Built Communities, Ms. Vernita Dorr from USDA, and Annie Brack, Center for a Better South. Uh, mayor Barnett, I'm going to start uh, with you and what has happened in Spartanburg, a purpose built community that has been built. I mean, if we went to Spartanburg 15 years ago, uh, the north side is probably not a place you really wanted to be. Uh, and there were all so many challenging issues that I think a lot of people thought, are you really going to tackle that? Is that really going to be a priority? Because it just seems like too big of a job to do and not an easy one as well. Just tell us briefly about how that came about and where it is now. Well, thank you all for uh, allowing us to tell our story. I hope we're helpful to the folks in this room. Uh, it all happened for me the week I became mayor of the city of Spartanburg. I had the opportunity of going to Atlanta and I met Carol and uh, watched Tom Cousins. Many of you have heard the story of Eastlake and uh, what was done in a very difficult environment in Atlanta, a place-based effort built around education, built around hope, built around um, a lot of effort, public-private partnerships to, to create change and to create a different model. Uh, I was enthused at that time and, and later on it became apparent that we had an opportunity in Spartanburg to emulate what uh, Eastlake had done and uh, to team up with purpose-built communities, which, uh, which, uh, which Carol is the president and which uh, has as its mission to, to try to help communities like ours and many others across the country, people in this room, uh, to uh, do exactly what they did there. Uh, we had a old mill village that had fallen on very difficult times uh, and uh, our goal was to, uh, to reclaim that, not only for a tax base but for an opportunity for the people who live there, the, the poverty, the concentrated poverty that was there, the, all the public housing that had fallen on difficult times. Uh, and we can discuss it. There is a, a clip I think everyone's going to see which, which uh, shows wh where we started and where we uh, have gone. We have a long way to go. So if there are things that I can share with the folks in this room, um, I'm happy to do it. I, I think there's a lot of uh, key learnings that we have uh, uh, had and, and things we've done right and things we've done wrong. And, and uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of place-based efforts within communities, uh, focused efforts, where the community as a whole gets together and tries to come up with a common plan to improve lives. And that's what we're trying to do, and that's what uh, East Lake has done. Before I talk to Carol, you're right, you brought up the video. Let's take a look now at uh, exactly what a purpose-built community looks like. One example. Growing up in the North Side, we had a true camaraderie with each other. The residents, we knew each other. We, knew, we, we were very close in the North Side community. The closing of the mill um, actually uh, was a tipping point where people started relocating. When that industry went away, the area came on some hard times. The city at the very beginning of this process realized that it was not a city project as much as it needed to be a community project. That's the true beauty of this, this whole effort. Uh, our partnership with Purpose Built, Northside Development Group, uh, Mary Black Foundation, Warford College, VCOM, our hospital system is amazing to see how we have been able to sit at the table understand what it takes to change uh, this very important piece of our community in the line of resources to ensure that it's, it's successful. And we believe that every person has the right to equal opportunity to health. And health includes availability of healthy foods and access to preventative and medical care. And the Harvest Park project has increased opportunities for residents to access healthy foods in the neighborhood 
in a neighborhood that otherwise has been considered a food desert. Education is one of the critical components of a purpose-built community. It's looking at the cradle-to-career pipeline, and one of the things that we saw as a need was access to high-quality early childhood. So the Mary Black Foundation made an initial investment of $1 million to build an early learning center in the north side. And just this past year, we increased our commitment by another $1.5 million. We have also instituted some early college models where our students have access to a college education as early as ninth grade and in many cases will earn their associate's degree prior to graduating from Spartanburg High School. The goal for all of this is the education of our children, but the reality of our journey is the importance of creating an environment, a geography around the schools where education is valued and where families are healthy, and where people feel safe, and people will invest. VCOM is delighted to have been in a position to come into uh, Spartanburg and invest $30 million to build uh, our medical school and complex, and recognizing we have a, an additional over $30 million economic impact every year. And we're delighted to be a catalyst for partnering with so many other folks in the neighborhood. We want to build affordable and market rate housing. It's a challenged environment because we have concentrated poverty in that area. Our goal is to break up the poverty and to give people hope. One of the things we knew at the beginning was that we had to be honest and transparent with everyone. And trust is a big issue in all of these efforts. So we have done one thing which I think was unique and very successful. And that is that we invested in a group of uh, people from the neighborhood um, and they were brought along as key participants in the conversation from day one. One of my reasons for being so committed to being a voyager as, as an advocate for the community is because the city and, and stakeholders and people that we work with, various entities, came to us, they came to us, they wanted to hear our voices. Having the Voyagers involved has made a big difference because, you know, a lot of people don't believe and they don't trust, you know, different entities to come in the community to do things. So having us as Voyagers in the community, living in the community amongst the people, helped to build trust. And I know that's part of, that's much of the reason why this project is a success. It's been a win for the community, not just uh, on the journey we travel together, but um, showing how cooperation and interaction with uh, different groups and different trust levels and so forth uh, could end up with a very positive result that people really had confidence that we could achieve. You know, if you were to ask me what the strength is of this school and what, what has really helped with the transformation, I will tell you it's the partnerships. Those partnerships, I believe, have been the impetus to helping everyone really start to believe that anything is possible. And we're so grateful, we're thankful f to Purpose Built because Purpose Built model has opened the dialogue for us to be able to do what we do. And I am grateful and I am thankful to be partners. A on behalf of the Voyagers, I'm thankful to be partners with Purpose Built Community as well as so many, many others. Our goal is to create a great space where healthy people live, where kids can play and be educated and where all of us can contribute to making it a better place for the next generation who lives in this community. So it's impossible to watch that video and not be inspired and not think of what could be the possibilities, even knowing that it's very difficult to get there. One of the things that resonates in that piece right there, and one I'm very familiar with, um, even Russell Booker, who I admire and love, you know, was, mm, is this really gonna work? When he heard stirred about it, trust. Very difficult to gain that trust in communities that have been disenfranchised, who have typically over the years been sold a bill of goods, whose promises have not been delivered. 
Is that the hardest part almost to get this thing off the ground? I think trust obviously is important. Uh, you can't watch a debate without people worrying about this country's uh, commitment to trust amongst one another. It's been well documented in these conversations thus far. I, um, the Voyagers, which were a group of uh, citizens who lived in the community and still live in the community, are our leaders. Uh, we have invested in training for them to give them a voice. Uh, everything we do, we, they get to see first. They sit on our board, several of them. We have given them all laptops so that when we see a documentation or a, a pictorial view of some building or, or some schematic, uh, they see it too. There's transparency and they have a voice and their opinion matters. That's right. And, and the community, and this may sound uh, strange to a lot of folks, but I, I see it in other communities. I, I see it in Lake City. I see it in right. Hartsville. I see it uh, in the work that uh, Charleston's doing in, in, in Greenville. I mean, there's a lot of uh, place-based effort in our state that serves as models for solving problems that are finite and that we can focus on, we can measure. Uh, Chief Alonzo Thompson's here somewhere in this audience. I saw and him. he and I have, he's the public safety director of, of uh, Spartanburg. If you saw the meteoric drop in crime, both against people and property over the last five years in this track, you would be amazed. And people are taking pride in what's going on. Up to now, they believe it. It is a long-term game, however. I, uh, when you get to Carol, she'll tell you they're at it 20 years. We've been right. at it five, and, and there's five or 10 years to go. And uh, one of the lessons in all this is you have to have leadership that is committed to sustain a long march to create change and to deliver on the other side. This is not a singular effort to build a building and walk away and declare victory. Okay, because Carol, when you think about that long march, you use the word holistic a lot, that that's the approach of the purpose-built community. It has to be holistic, you know, bringing together education, uh, health, housing. You know, typically these entities, you know, exist in silos, really. That's right. So you have to bring these together, which is not easy, but is that part of the reason why it is such a long-term commitment? Um, I think so. I mean, the reality is that um, people and communities didn't get in a difficult place in three years or five years or ten years. This is something that has taken generations to have happened um, in most places. And you're not going to create um, that kind of transformative change in a three-year grant cycle. So you've got to find leaders like Bill who are committed and willing to dig in and say, I'm here through this process to work with and for the community to help change um, that place from what I read in The Economist once, calling neighborhoods like that a swamp where kids and families are mired to change those neighborhoods into launch pads where kids and families can reach their full potential. When uh, we started in Eastlake, we used to say that um, our, our uh, model was holistic and we were kind of doing everything. And, and that's not quite accurate. We realized we had to sit back and say, well, what did we really do? And we realized that there was a very clear model for this work and, and our experience. And we thought that that could be um, transported. I won't say replicated because that suggests it's cookie cutter and it's never cookie cutter. Um, but that there was a really clear model here, and that's a deep dive into a very small geography, what people experience as a neighborhood. Because the reality is um, a city is made up of neighborhoods, and if neighborhoods aren't working for people who live there, then the city's not working. And so if we can put this neighborhood lens on it and think about um, going cross uh, silo and think about the horizontal slice of how people experience life in a neighborhood, we can get where we need to be. So a deep dive into a neighborhood. Within that neighborhood, there are three kind of core strategies and investment. The first one is around mixed income housing. We're believers that isolating low, fam low income families in neighborhoods by themselves doesn't work for anybody, most importantly for the low income families who live there. We believe that mixed income is an important sustainability strategy. It helps attract um, other resources to the community that everybody benefits from, especially the low income families. The next strategy is building that cradle through college, through career education pipe 
pipeline, and all of those words are important, starting with really high quality early learning, moving up to a great K-12 experience, and then connecting young people with post-secondary education that is meaningful and will allow them to be able to support their families um, in a way we know is, is desirable. And then the third piece is around health and wellness and not just the delivery of medical care, but thinking about what does it take for people to be able to live a healthy and vibrant life. Um, sometimes that is medical care and access to medical care. Um, but it's also a YMCA, it's a community rec center, it's, it's community access gardens. Access to good food. All those kinds of things. Access to the kind of programs that allow everybody to reach their full potential. But what we have, we have what we call a secret sauce. And Bill Barnett is part of that secret sauce. It's called a community quarterback which is a newly created nonprofit whose only reason for existence is to make sure that there's very complex, cross-sectoral, long-term initiative, um, creates a community vision, and then works with all the partners necessary to implement that vision over time. So and you think a great to be leader. successful, you really need a strong point person in each of these communities? Uh, you need to both have that strong point person and then, as I say, institutionalize that point person. Um, Bill, we're not really sending you to the hospital, but, uh, but, but we're creating that organization. Uh, we're creating that organization that will s be sustained um, because, again, this is a 20-year initiative. And, you know, we, we want to have a group of leaders, um, including residents in the community, take ownership for making sure that this happens and continues to be executed at really high standards. I'll, I'll say just quickly, for too long in too many low-income neighborhoods, we take a good enough is good enough approach. And, and I would say that's absolutely the wrong approach. In the neighborhoods that we care about, kids don't get second chances. We need to be really good at what we do. We need to be excellent at what we do. And we need to insist that our program partners, our educators, our schools, our health and wellness providers are all doing a first-class job, not just merely good enough which has been the story for far too long. In exactly. Many Let's move on to, to our other participants here uh, on, the, on the dais, if we can, please. Andy Brack, Center for a Better South. If you will, the elevator speech for what has happened in the low country called the Promise Zone Initiative. And we're talking about Jasper County, Allendale County, the Callens, counties that have traditionally been marked by persistent poverty. This is a game changer of sorts. Just explain to the audience for many who don't know exactly what this is. Well, this is, we'll get to the map in the video, but it's essentially the area, the Promise Zone is a federal designation that was awarded to the six counties in the lower part of the state. Think of it as the area, everything west of I-95 up to Barnwell. So from Jasper up to Walterboro over to almost Augusta. This is an area of about 90,000 people. It has a, a poverty rate of about 28.3%, an unemployment rate a couple years ago of 15%. It is, if you recall from one of these conferences two or three years ago, it is the, the quintessential forgotten South Carolina. Remember when the Post and Courier guys came here and talked about the for forgotten South Carolina? People have been forgotten. And we were fortunate enough to work with the Southern Carolina Economic uh, Development Alliance to put in an application for this new Promise Zone designation. Uh, it's something that President Obama announced in 2009. We applied for it in November of 2005 and won it uh, in, in April. So we've been at it less than a year right now. In fact, today, if you want to see what we're going to do, we've spent about eight months coming up with a long-term strategic vision like you were talking about. And it, it is being now announced today at scpromisezone.org. We've encountered and worked with about 1,000 people across the six county area in various public forums to develop this. But the purpose of a promise zone, the purpose of this designation is not to dump a pool of money on people. It's to give people, encourage them to work together for a broad community division, uh, a broad community vision to apply for federal grants and to get preferential treatment for those grants. If you apply for a grant through the Promise Zone, in other words, uh, an, if you're an organization, uh, and we have about 40 different partners and supporters, if you apply for the, the, a, a grant through the Promise Zone through 14 different federal agencies, 
uh, you get preferential treatment if you get the letter from the Promise Zone that says that this is something that meets our vision. It's essentially fast-tracked. It's fast-tracked preferential treatment. The thing that's interesting and I think is absolutely brilliant about this program is that it does not come with money. It, you have to use the existing federal process to get grants. You just get a preferential treatment. That makes it less political. That means that the people who are applying for the grant, if they receive the grant, they have to meet the accountability standards, the transparency standards, and they have to do all the stuff that's currently required in, pre in federal law. Before we watch this video, the, uh, the Promise Zone Initiative, we'll say in the interest of full disclosure, I have worked with Andy uh, on this project through the electric cooperatives. We're very supportive of this project. We have many members that live down there. And of course, we have a vested interest in seeing uh, those incomes rise. So I just want to say that uh, for what it's worth. But we do have a video of what the Promise Zone Initiative can and will look like down the road. Building new opportunities to reduce poverty. That's the focus of the newly designated South Carolina Low Country Promise Zone. It stretches from Walterboro and Bamberg through Barnwell and Allendale to Hampton and Hardyville. The new Promise Zone designation for our area is a blessing for us. Working with our partners and working with our allies, we are able to bring opportunity to our six county region in creating jobs and sharing our vision with our allies and with our federal agencies that are working with us. It's been a tremendous opportunity for us to change the face of our region. More than three dozen state and local agencies, nonprofits, and other organizations are the backbone to this new collaborative effort to make lives better for people in the lower part of the Palmetto State. The objectives of the Promise Zone are to grow jobs and increase economic activity, improve educational opportunities, leverage private investment, reduce violent crime, and enhance public health and address other priorities such as housing. And we're doing that right now thanks to efforts of our partners and supporters. They're using the Promise Zone designation to make applications for federal grants to address our key issues. What makes this Promise Zone process such a big deal is that our grant applicants get extra points for making requests just for being in the zone. Often, just a few extra points can be the difference between getting the federal funding that's needed to seed transformational projects or not getting the funding. The process is already working. Within just months of being named a Promise Zone, we've generated some $12 million of federal grants and loans. The funding is paying for everything from major infrastructure improvements that will help attract industries to grants that will help local markets and farmers do more for their communities. And thanks to the recruiting success of our lead partner, the Southern Carolina Regional Development Alliance, the Promise Zone region has already nabbed more than $400 million in capital investment that's creating more than 200 new jobs in our region. The partnership of Southern Carolina and the Promise Zone is creating an exciting story being shared with businesses and investors across the country and globe. We've got big dreams and are already working on major projects that will transform our neck of the woods. We want high-speed broadband internet access available through all parts of our six counties. We are working to develop a shovel-ready mega site for industrial development to bring in major new jobs. We are investing in building a sustainability culture to take advantage of our assets in agriculture, technology, tourism, and energy. We're working to transform public education and health care through innovation, collaboration, and plain old-fashioned hard work. Don't be surprised in the days ahead to learn more about how our Promise Zone partners and supporters are applying for and winning significant grant funding. It will generate more affordable housing, better schools, and better health care throughout our region. Opportunity is here in the South Carolina Promise Zone. Our time is now. Visit us online at www.scpromisezone.org. 
or just come by and visit us to see how we're creating an exciting future. Okay, we have Vernita Dorr from the U.S. Uh, Department of Agriculture here. Just want a show of hands, please. How many people are aware that the USDA is actively involved in economic development? It's a pretty good, <laughs> pretty good number. Typically, when I go to speak about this, uh, it's it's much lower. But we have a very educated crowd here. Uh, Vernita, the the USDA involved in a project like this. One, we've already have evidence from the first wave of Promise Zone initiatives. Uh, that this appears to be working in places like Louisville, in places like Newark, New Jersey. We have evidence to suggest that is this a home run or still a work in progress? Where are you with this? Very good question. First of all, thank you for having me here today. I'm glad to be here. Um, where we are with this is exactly what you've seen. The goal of this targeted uh, investment a pool is for the people the leaders and community folks, folks who are involved in the community, folks who live in the community to come together. That alone is huge because too often we have people representing us that don't understand us, that don't really understand what, what it is in my community within the community. And having visited the Promise Zone and been a part of the conversations, I've seen people engaged that I never dreamed would come together. The federal government's position is, this is your community. You decide what it is you want, but we want you to know that we can back you up. <coughs> we back have up the how? tools. I mean, we with loans, or is it block grants, or is it just doling out money? What are the mechanics of how this works? Ah, uh, not doling out money. <laughs> All right. I teed you up there. All right, you did. And it's not only grants. It's some grants, but low interest, long-term loans that make our products affordable. At USDA Rural Development, we say we can help you build your community from the ground up. And I'm talking about from infrastructure, for example, an $8 million water loan at low interest rate for 40 years in Hampton County just recently. I'm talking about the new campus, uh, Salkalhatchee. We uh, invested money in that for the uh, campus, um, for the children, the, what do you call it? The seesaw for Hatchie. I know, but yeah. the, I should know I have a child in college, the room and board. Uh. All right, <laughs> all right, just, so we have that, we've invested money for that. Um, they talk about crime being a problem. We have uh, money for police cars, for uh, police buildings, Anything you need, for example, YMCAs, that's a wonderful tool. We did that in Aiken, which is not in this Promise Zone, but it helps bring families together. The children can be involved in an activity while the parents could be in an activity. Things of that nature we can do with Rural Development USDA. Our mission at Rural Development is a, to see a community come together. That is our mission. Go ahead. It, it, the, the, uh, at, in Allendale, which is kind of the core of this whole area, it's a, at about 40% in poverty. And USDA did a wonderful thing in Allendale about a year and a half ago before the Promise Zone exists. And it, if you go to USC Salkahatchee, there is a, a dorm there now that she was talking That's about. That's what I was talking about. And <laughs> it, it's got 100 beds in it. But the Whereas cool thing, before, the, people, people had to travel miles. They had miles, to drive. If they could travel. That's right. And, but think about this. There's not a lot of places to eat in Allendale. I mean, there's a couple of fast food restaurants, um, but there's not a lot of sit-down restaurants. But the, when you then have 100 kids who are living in Allendale now, and by the way, there's a waiting list for those rooms. When you have that many, they're bringing in money, and they're going to want to do something in that community. That's a visionary uh, it's, a, it's a federal pr package that helped build a, a, a dorm, but it's a visionary community thing for that area. It's, it's really exciting. And it's not just pouring money in. We're responding to the needs. And we also loaned money for, a, or gave money for a strategic plan. Mm -hmm. So it's not just going here. It's a well thought out plan by community leaders, community uh, people to 
respond to the needs of that community. Yeah, because One. as Carol mentioned, you know, this wasn't a process in these counties that happened overnight. No. This is long-term generational decay that requires a long-term vision to revive those communities, and that's what this basically does. Mm -hmm. We talk a lot about public-private partnerships, Mr. Barnett, uh, that has to happen in order to make all of these projects work can't be government directed. You can't just go to private business and say it's up to you. Um, you have to have those relationships in order to move forward. Are they difficult to bring together sometimes? I hear people complain about the bureaucracy of both sides, uh, getting people to agree on what that vision might look like. What are those challenges? Yeah, of course it's difficult. And uh, it takes, I think, I think it does take leadership. I think it takes a common vision that people can buy into. Uh, I know in, in, in one purpose-built community, Birmingham, Alabama, the city was so impressed by the private sector they decided not to get involved because they figured they had other problems to solve and right. let the right. private sector solve it. I think that's correct. That's right. And um, in our community, that's exactly the opposite. The city has been very involved and very interested. The hospital has been very involved and interested. Health, the health piece of this is extremely important. Uh, we are adjacent to Wofford College. Uh, all, uh, I think every major institution in our community is a member of our advisory council. We meet every other month and tell them everything that's going on. You brought up Wofford College and I don't want to gloss over that because they're actively involved and participate in a lot of the things that you do. Th they are. They have resources that you otherwise might not have. We, we are a canvas, a learning canvas. Uh, Greenville is a learning canvas for Furman, um, and uh, all of us have these institutions in our community. Historically, I think we have been loath, or they have been loath to, to contribute money. We went to Wofford and asked them to give us a low interest, I call it a soft loan. I guess that means in my mind, they'll never get paid back, but. <laughs> uh, Do they know that? <laughs> I don't know if they know that yet, but Elizabeth's about to tell them. But I, I think, uh, uh, you know, there is no institution in your community that ought not stand up and be involved in improving the community. I mean, Baltimore was mentioned before, and, and think of the role of Johns Hopkins opposite um, all the challenges associated with Baltimore. And there's a great book, which I read to a, with a group of young African-American boys in, in our community called The Other West Moore. I don't know if you've ever read the book. He's coming, actually, to Spartanburg next week. It's a story of of uh, two boys by the name of Westmore, both of whom lived within blocks of one another, both of whom came from single mom homes. One, because of the virtues of his family, went to military school, went to college, and became a Rhodes Scholar. The other is in jail for life for murdering. And the one Westmore went to the jail, to the penitentiary, to learn about the other. It is so telling about what we as leaders in our community need to understand to create change. And I think every institution in every community, whether they have historically um, become a bubble in and of themselves or not, have an enormous responsibility to participate in creating good solutions that cut across um, the entire community. And, and we aren't scared of asking anybody to participate. And if they don't want to participate, it's up to them, but shame on them. I'll give you one interesting. <laughs> public shaming. Public shaming. I'll give you one interesting story. I went to a person, I'll, I'll, I'll leave the person unnamed, who uh, I got on my guts and I went and asked this person who didn't live in Spartanburg uh, to make a gift, a, a contribution to the, an unrestricted contribution, which is very important to us because if, if it's unrestricted, we can use it for a lot of stuff. And, um, he, uh, he's, he kept saying to me, well, what do you want? I said, well, finally I blurted out, I want $250,000 over four years. The next week I got a check for a million bucks. So anyone in this room who's scared to ask people to be involved in what is right and what can rebuild your community, um, I think you should think it out again. I think there are people all over our communities and our state who are searching for ways to become involved in improving the very problems that we all know are going to threaten 
our very existence. And I think we have a lot of them right here in this room. Sure you do. No question. Carol, you mentioned that there's not one cookie cutter approach. Correct. Each community is different, but there has to be common threads, mm -hmm. right? When you go to speak about purpose-built communities to a place that is distressed, that is perhaps looking for answers, what are some of those common threads that will exist, even though one size does not fit all? So, so our model is a model that works in urban neighborhoods. It would not be the right model for Allendale, for example. Um, so we know with, within our model that there, there are common threads of mixed income housing, a cradle through college education pipeline, and community health and wellness, but how you get there in every community is very different. How the community quarterback is created is very different in every community. In Spartanburg, um, Bill knew this was something that he was passionate about, and the new mayor asked him to take a leadership role in starting this community quarterback and moving it forward. In Charlotte, the uh, Charlotte Housing Authority launched, uh, actually launched a community quarterback by um, creating a, a grant agreement to pay, the, pay its operating expenses for the first two years of existence because it knew that the coordinating role, the visioning role um, that the community quarterback could do wasn't within their skill set. They knew they needed it. So that government entity kind of launched it, but it is not a government ent entity. Um, so that we find these all in different ways. How you get to mixed income housing is different in every place as well. What works in Spartanburg, what works in Atlanta, what works in Omaha and Columbus, all very different, but the concept around providing housing in a neighborhood that serves families across a broader range of incomes is sound and there's lots of ways to get there. Same thing on education. And if I was queen of the world, I would be working exclusively with charter schools in neighborhood revitalizations, provided that those charters could in fact be neighborhood serving. Um, and that's not because I, I don't love public schools. I went to public schools. I'm the daughter of a public school teacher and now the proud mother of a public school teacher. Um, but, pu but public schools as a bureaucracy lack a nimbleness right. in making changes and doing things differently in different kinds of schools. They look at equity as being doing the same thing everywhere. And we would argue that you've got to have different strategies based on what the children's needs are, meeting the children where they That's are. That's right, because what works in a high-income neighborhood is not going to work in an underserved community when it comes to education. Probably not. That's exactly right. So you want to be nimble. You want to be able to make adjustments. So, so a charter can be a really good, nimble partner. That being said, in 50% of the places where Purpose Built is working, we're working within traditional public school systems. So we'll see if the tr traditional public school systems can be nimble, can make those adjustments, because frankly, that would be wonderful. And that would tell us that there's a way to get there at scale in a much faster way. So we are cautiously optimistic, um, but we'll see what happens. Uh, good luck with that. Thank you. It's very difficult to, to, to move a bureaucracy like public education, as I found out. Andy, the biggest needs in those six counties that we're talking about, as the Promise Zone initiative was announced, were there a set of initiatives that people most wanted? Were there th things that came up to the forefront that, you know, we really need to focus on housing or infrastructure should be our top priority? I mean, what are the things that people are coming to you most with their concerns? What, what do they want done first? We met with 650 people over four days in six town hall meetings. The people who live in the Promise Zone, those 90,004 people, they know what the challenges are in their communities and they have fantastic ideas. And the, the ideas filled a 200-page document. Um, what, what we've done in bringing everybody together in a collaborative spirit is to try to hone those into the big ticket items. And some of the things that the communities seem to look at is that we need some transformational big ticket items, big ticket ideas. And those are the things like er businesses are not gonna move into the promise zone if they don't have high speed internet. Right. And so every group that's working within the promise zone, that's kind of one of their general goals. Businesses are not gonna move, uh, or there may not be a way to massively reduce poverty if we don't try to attract the next Volvo. That's one of the ideas that people se seem to agree on, and that's why we're working to have a shovel-ready mega site. Um, there are a lot of internal advantages. 
in Barnwell, there are a lot of really smart people who have energy experience. That's right. But in Hampton County, they know how to grow watermelons and they know how to grow stuff. So let's take advantage of the successes and the experience we have and sustain that by investing in, 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 the, in the community. We learn from a lot of county council and, and, and elected leaders that they mostly want infrastructure, roads, water, sewer. Uh, uh, the undersecretary mentioned how there's a, an $8 million package in Hampton County. It's not very sexy what that money is going to do. It's going to clean out their sewerage systems. But, but incredibly important to those people. Right. Huge priority. It, they were 30% they were, it, it, they were filled with sludge. That's right. Well, guess what? You take the sludge out, you, that means you add the capacity of 30%, which means you can go and get another business, which means people get jobs, which means people build wealth, which pe means people get out of poverty. I, I look at the, the promise zone as the ultimate spinoff investment. It eventually gets down from investing in communities, from collaborating together to make differences in people's lives to the point that you get that spinoff to make those investments. And, and Ms. Dora, this is not a short-term initiative. The no. Promise Zone designation, 10 years, long time horizon. You don't have to get everything done you know, within the small window of opportunity. That affords some strategic long-term thinking, which hasn't always been associated with uh, government programs. By So that, I would think, would help you in the long run to know that time is on your side. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the word time. Mm -hmm. Time is a major factor in this. We're in the 60-minute day. No, you, there's longer than that. It takes time. Anything worth having is worth investing your time, your energy, your resources in. And that will be the true factor. That will help explain, that will carry you through. If you have the patience, if you have the commitment to make this work, it can. And as far as USDA rural development is concerned, we're gonna be here. We're gonna be here when you're a promise zone, when you're not a promise zone. We're gonna be here. And I'm so grateful about this initiative because people are heard. And when people are heard and they feel included, then they're gonna be a part of it. They, there's buy-in, and that's one of the critical components to this whole thing. People being heard, people being included, and working together with partners. Mm -hmm. You have to have a vision. There is a vision. For the and, first time, there's a vision. Yeah, for the first time. It's been a long uh, progress process. People have been overlooked. Hampton County, Allendale County, all of those counties have been in poverty for so long. And I think they feel really good about having big, big shoulders. People who are really saying, yeah, we, you matter. All of these things, the people part is huge. And this is happening really for the first time and not just one generation, but two or three generations yeah. for most of those people. Yes, yes. You're itching to say something. I know, I can tell by your body language. What do you have to add to that? <laughs> You better than my wife. <laughs> no, I, 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 I am um, challenged. I know this takes time. I start out my conversation by saying this is a long-term deal. But every year we have another cohort of children that go through our world and are, are lost or, or have less opportunity. Time, and maybe it's my age, but time bothers the hell out of me. Mm -hmm. and, and I think... Um, I think the idea of us sitting back and debating um, investment in our children is is um, there's no time to debate. There, there's no need to debate, right? I also want to. Uh, there are people in this room, and I hope I hope in this interaction you all meet some of them. Uh, there are resources in our in our state that are terrific. Uh, Deborah McKetty's here somewhere. I think Deborah's over there, who uh, lives in Greenville, and I go to her about once a month, try to figure out what I'm doing wrong. Bernie Mazik is here, who mm -hmm. represents a remarkable institution in our community, in our state. Um, there's a lot of resources. You just have to connect them all. And, but it's important, and, um, and I commend everyone here to, to uh, not to be uneasy with our world and our society, but to be uneasy with our own contribution to changing it. That, that change, Carol, you talk about Herculean change, really, with that initiative at East Lake, um, to get that buy-in and get people to go ahead and agree to move forward, 
even with all the success you have, do you still have folks who look askance at what's been accomplished, who are still non-believers, who still say, yeah, it works there, but you really can't transport yeah. down to Columbus, Georgia. Yeah, no, that's, a, that's exactly right. Everybody yeah. thinks their community is different. They'll say, well, it worked here, but it'll never work there. Yeah, you, you've um, never been to my place. Uh, yeah, and, and the reality is certainly there's lots of local conditions that require different kinds of adjustments and different strategies. And you've got, you know, drastically different um, real estate situations. So, you know, if you're thinking about rebuilding a neighborhood, you have to think about what the real estate needs are and what the real estate challenges are. So in Spartanburg, for example, there was a lot of vacant land, a lot of abandoned homes. So there's an opportunity to really acquire a lot of land to rebuild and reinvest without having to displace anybody. And that was a really core value to the Spartanburg team. In other places where we're working like Houston or Oakland, where the, everything is so dense, in Oakland, the, the land in this really struggling, violent, challenged neighborhood Prices went up 42% last year. Right. So, so, you know, there's a different real estate strategy that will have to be deployed in order to be able to control land to create high quality housing that will be in place for low income families to be able to share in what's going to happen in that neighborhood going forward. If we don't control that land quickly, we'll lose an opportunity to create a great opportunity in East Oakland. So, we have to be nimble, we have to look at the different um, challenges in every place and address those. I would like to think about the folks in this room. Um, I think probably there are a lot of you who share a lot of Bill's characteristics. Um, and I, I would call Bill a tri-sector athlete. Um, he's, he, he's a guy who has had great success in the private sector. He's had great success in the nonprofit sector as a board member, as a leader. And he's great, had great success in the public sector. And I think folks who have those experiences in those three sectors are uniquely situated to be key levers in this kind of work because, you know, Bill, you said something to me once about, you know, your experience of being a mayor, you know, that builds some, some kind of empathy and some kind of appreciation for the challenges that people have in their lives. Um, if you hadn't been a mayor, you might not look at the world in the same way. So, so I, I would encourage you, those of you who may be two sector athletes right now, Think about how you broaden your skill set or broaden your experience by working in that one that you don't currently have because you will be positioned to solve problems in a very different way um, as a result of that experience. Yeah, but don't, don't try to be mayor. <laughs> <laughs> there must be a mayor here. Uh, I think that's very true. Hey, you're the one fielding the phone calls because the trash hasn't been picked up, you know, and things like that. Andy Brack. Uh, fast forward 10 years, yeah. if you could envision what these six counties will look like in a perfect world, and I know the world's not perfect, but what is your hope 10 years from now that we gather back together and we look at those six counties and what has happened, what would your vision be? Not to, I think the easiest way to say it is that, that I work myself out of a job because in 10 years, I would hope that we have $5 billion in capital investment. And I hope that we have 500 million in federal loans and grants. I think that if we have this huge investment in this forgotten area of South Carolina, that it will transform itself and realize the potential that people know they have. Um, a lot of the effort that we are going to be engaged in over the next nine years and two months is to build capacity in communities. And we have to provide people with the, the training opportunities so that they can um, take advantage of the assistance of the federal government, but more than anything, take advantage of their talents and skills that they have themselves and change their communities. I think probably the most heartening thing. I mean, I, I often tell people that you don't get 125 people to show up at a wonky meeting in Allendale County, but we did. Oh, yeah. Right. And, yeah. and, and, you know, the only place you get that is a basketball game in church. So they thought enough of the effort and the steering by the federal government to say, help yourself. We want to help you if you can, but go help yourself. And, and, and to me, that's extremely encouraging. So in 10 years, I hope that that the work groups that we have uh, uh, instituted to solve some of the community problems, I, I hope that they are 
running on their own, they don't need any steering, and they, it's changed the culture there so that the people realize that they can solve their own problems. They may need to apply for a grant or a loan, but they may be able to do things inside their communities because they've gotten experience and they feel more empowered to do so. As somebody who works there and travels there a great deal, my goal would be that it's an area full of hope at the end of the day, simple as that. Mr. Barnett, Ms. Naughton, Ms. Doerr, Andy Brack, thank you so much for sharing your views, for sharing your experiences. These are great, great topics. Thank you for being here at One South Carolina. Thank you, thank you Mark.